My parents were what was popularly known as, as 10 pound poms and emigrated to Australia uh, in 1946 when I was five years old, or virtually six years old. Um, I don't think they knew quite what they were in for because although my father was quite well travelled and had been to South Africa and places like that, my mother was a, a music graduate from the Royal College of London and um, to find herself in Scottsdale, population 1,000, tin roofs, rainwater tanks, no sewerage, uh, was a fairly, fairly big jump, I think, and, and she was never really very happy being in Tasmania at all. But uh, you didn't have a lot of choice where you went as a 10 pound pom. If you had taken advantage of that system, uh, you had to go where the government told you for the first two years, uh, and you'd have to pay it back again if you didn't, and pay for your own fare back uh, if you didn't stay. Once my father had then been able to choose where he went, he got a good job in Hobart, the capital, and we were then there for another for eight years after that. So we had 10 years in Australia altogether. My father had bought me a really deluxe pedal car because he knew how mad I was about cars. Um, so I think that was a natural progression to decide that if they weren't looking, I'd borrow the car and you know, drive it out on the road. And of course, there was hardly any traffic around in those days anyway, so I couldn't see what would be a problem. The real problem was actually trying to do anything in it once I got in it. You know, uh, letting the handbrake off was obviously a major undertaking because those old handbrakes had a, a sort of lever on it that you needed quite a lot of strength to, to actually let them go. Once I had let it go and the car started rolling, uh, you know, it took me a moment or so to try and, to grab the wheel, which I could only just reach, uh, and discover that obviously there was no way I was going to be able to steer the car at all. You know, guiding it was going to be completely impossible because I didn't have the strength at that age. So it just uh, glided very, very slowly and softly into the side of the house. Slight, fortunately, it didn't do very much damage to the side of this weatherboard house. Um, and my parents came rushing out, very worried that, uh, you know, that they hadn't taken good enough care of me and should have been monitoring what I was up to when I'd been in the garage and <laughs> that I'd let the car rolled down accidentally, which of course wasn't true. I miss, in fact even miss now, uh, the, the freedom in Tasmania. I've been back three times in the last 15 years uh, and remember it all so clearly of just what it was like. Um, and I think those, those initial years of your childhood have an incredible effect because they, um, they form your opinions and your ideas. Uh, and they never really go, even though that seems so long ago and for such a short time and compared to the rest of my life. Uh, I feel as though I've always had a Tasmanian feeling about what I do. And the examples are things like, if I'm narrating a concert as a conductor, uh, I find it very hard to uh, do the formality, the sort of typical European formality of starting a concert by saying, oh, our first piece is by Beethoven and when he was such and such an age, he was then into his certain formative period or whatever. Uh, I find myself just wanting to talk to people in the audience as though they're just ordinary people and I'm talking to them. So, I mean, I have even started off a concert by explaining to the audience that we were very lucky to be able to play uh, this particular concert because the trumpet player had fallen off his bike uh, on the way to the concert and we were very worried if he was going to be able to play. Uh, and for me, that is a natural way to talk to an audience. To begin with, I used to worry that audiences probably wouldn't like that. But in actual fact, many audiences have said to me, that's fantastic because it's nice to be, not see you as a stuck up musician there dressed up in the front, but actually relates to the musicians themselves and makes them realize that musicians are just ordinary people, just leading slightly different lives and doing what they do. So from, from coming back from Tasmania, uh, that's very hard to, to know quite where to start. That's 1956. I had a short time in school in Tasmania because, uh, sorry, in, in England when I came back. Because the education system is very different, it meant that I was actually behind in certain subjects. Uh, for instance, languages, they don't start until they're 13 instead of 11. Uh, and actually in front in other subjects. So really school became a bit of a bind to me and I didn't know quite what to do. So I sort of, I joined the army as a band boy in the Royal Artillery, having no idea what I was letting myself in for. Uh, when they issued me with a scratchy uniform and a big pair of boots, then I realised all right, and wished I hadn't done it. But unfortunately in those days, whereas now you get a choice if you want to stay in or come out, 
uh, in those days you had to stay in for the nine, eleven years, whatever, whether you liked it or not, or you had to pay a fortune to get out. So I didn't really have a lot of choice then. So I spent eleven years in the army, which admittedly there was a lot of parts that were good fun and very interesting, doing all these sort of jobs in Britain like the Lord Mayor's Show and Earl's Court and the Edinburgh Tattoo and all the rest of it, uh, and having a period in Germany which was you know, good fun. Um, really I didn't like it that much and I was actually quite keen to get out and managed to get out when I was about 27 um, and in a way feel guilty now because in actual fact I have actually been very successful as a musician and a music educator and virtually all of it has been due to the training and experience that I had in the army. So, you know, really now I ought to say thank you very much, army. Thank you, Royal Artillery Band. You know, you got me where I am today. Well, of course, I mean, I do actually tell these stories at gatherings and things like that and when I'm entertaining people. Um, and although I do have quite a lot from my musical life as a general, in general, the army obviously has to contain the greatest amount of them. Uh, for a start, of course, there are obviously a lot of mishaps, fortunately, that most of, most of the public never see. Um, and if they do see, they perhaps don't realise or um, things are corrected fairly quickly. For instance, on the Lord Mayor's show, a friend of mine, his saxophone sling broke, uh, and so we had to tie it on with string. And the Lord Mayor's show is about, I've forgotten how far, but probably about two miles each way. So you've got a four mile trip to do during the course of the afternoon. So he had his saxophone tied on with string and then while he was marching along the string broke he wasn't able to catch the saxophone as it fell and it hit his foot so it actually came out of the front of the band uh, past the drum major you know the chap with his mace and all the rest of it who sort of looked down a bit horrified wondering what it was but of course as we went past the saxophone people picked it up handed it back to him and he just had to hold it until we got to a place where we could tie it all back up again you know so, you know, there were obviously the accidental parts of it. Uh, there were times when there were things that you were worried about accidents that you thought might happen. For instance, there was a, the drum majors in Britain are fairly limited as to what they can do with maces, which are very heavy pieces of equipment which are used to signal to the band to stop, stop playing, uh, start playing, march, stop marching, all the rest of it. But uh, on the continent, drum majors are still allowed to send these things all over the place and really play up to the crowds with them. Uh, and we did a mass bands display uh, in Holland, including a Belgian band with a Belgian drum major who was in charge of the mass bands. So there's about 150, 200 of us in this huge auditorium. Uh, and this drum major was sending the mace absolutely miles up in the air. It was spinning around. You could almost hear it going whizz, 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 as it went way, way up. Uh, and of course, this drum major was just standing out there with his arm, quite happily, waiting for it to come back in again, which it always did, not worrying in the slightest. But there were a couple of hundred musicians who were all going around absolutely terrified, assuming that there was a danger this might land on them. And, and it would, you know, it would really do you some pretty terrible injuries if it hit you. I married quite early when I first went to Germany with a section of the Royal Artillery Band for about 18 months. And uh, I met a German girl there that I fell in love with and eventually married. Uh, she had a son already uh, who I was only too happy to take on as my son. And uh, we had three children then uh, in the early 60s, or early to mid 60s, and then another one in the late 60s. So there were four children in that marriage. And I was married to Ingrid for, I think, 18, virtually 19 years. Uh, and uh, we didn't separate until the end of the 60s, but, uh, sorry, the end of the 70s. Um, so those children are now, you know, obviously an important part of my life. Unfortunately, one, my son Martin, uh, who was only 45, uh, died um, last year. So we were very, very sad to lose him. Um, we're only, the only thing we can be grateful about is that as far as we know, it was a very quick ending and he can't have known much about it or suffered any particular great pain so you know that at least was something and certainly his memory lives on we're not likely to forget him in a hurry he was a very kind and very generous person and great fun to be with in the early 80s um, i married uh, a lady in lincoln 
uh, again, who had a child, uh, Emma, who was five years old at that time, who I was very happy to take on as my daughter. Um, and we had a son of our own, Adam, uh, who is now in the Air Force, and he was born in 1981. So what does that make him now? Someone will else have to do the maths for me. 30. 30, thank you. A bit of prompting there. Um, so, uh, you know, we have two children, and that obviously was um, very nice from that marriage. Uh, unfortunately, for various reasons, that deteriorated. And uh, so eventually we separated. Um, and then I sound as though I'm going around the world for my wives, basically. But then in the 90s, um, I met Cricket, uh, my, um, my wife, who is American, and is called Cricket because when she was a child, she kept everybody awake in the, the, the woods of North America, where she was born, North New York State. And so they named her after the insect Cricket because it keeps people awake at night. So anyway, I married Cricket in uh, 1984. Well, married. We met in 1984, uh, and we married subsequently. Uh, sorry. 1994, would it be? Uh, yeah, 1994. Yeah. So I was married to <laughs> Elizabeth. To get all the things right, from 1980 to uh, 93ish, 92ish, something like that. Um, and you know, I've been very happy with cricket. We're very happy together. We've been together. Uh, Virtually, this will be my longest marriage, which sounds terrible because it sounds like I'm a serial, whatever they call it, monogamist or whatever they call it. Um, and I think part of that reason that we've gone on so successfully together has been that in many ways, although it probably wouldn't seem like this to most people, the type of background we come from is actually quite similar because neither of us have typically British backgrounds. She was born in the really up near the Canadian border in northern New York State, so she is used to a bit like me, wide open spaces and freedom, same as I was in Tasmania. Um, and I think our attitudes from that are definitely, you know, I'm not being insulted to British attitude, but they're certainly non-British. Uh, we have a, a much more open attitude to a lot of things. It's very difficult to say what's important about music because obviously I find it rather strange now that in a way I can live without it. Um, I find it a bit of an effort to get myself to play anymore. It's not really a huge pleasure. I mean, I am doing it now because I would quite like to go out and entertain people again. So I think because of that, I'm actually starting to enjoy it a bit more. Uh, and of course, I'm deliberately now playing a lot of music that I've had stored away and never got around to playing. So I'm deliberately picking things that are uh, new to me uh, to make it a little bit more of an adventure. Um, during my life, I think, I don't know, my life really when my life really existed to music, if you like. You know, I mean, for instance, I always have songs in my head, tunes in my head, and even now I still do. Quite often I have no idea where the tunes are coming from, uh, and I have to search to find out what it is that sparked it off. So, you know, it may have been something that happened a little while ago. Uh, I remember once we had a, a, a car, a second car, a Lada Samara, and as I walked through the garage to get to my car that I was usually actually going to work in, I would actually have to walk past that as I went out of the garage, uh, and I would actually see the word Samara on it. And it was only after a few days uh, I managed to twig that a particular song that I was singing had actually been started by that, had been triggered by that. And that was Samara, Samara, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, the word had been close enough to trigger something a little bit off the wall, really, at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, I'm never, never quite sure what it is that started me singing I do like to be beside the seaside or Daisy Daisy or something like that. But things happen in life that trigger these songs. So I have to make the assumption that my head is actually full of music anyway, and I'm never really going to get rid of it, you know. And obviously the stuff I play won't go away. I'm practicing a number of pieces now with the hope of doing these talks and things like that. And of course, they just bury themselves in my head, uh, whatever I've just been playing in the other room there. Um, and I'll be going around singing that for you know quite a few days afterwards every time. So my head just really is full of music, I suppose. Is there anything else you want to say? No, that I think that really covers the three different things, that uh, the love of the outdoors and scenery and country, which is obviously why I love living here, where I do in Appleby. Uh, in this beautiful scenery and in such a beautiful place. 
that part of it is important. Uh, the love of music, obviously, is always important to me because it's around all the time and I can still be involved in it. And, of course, the love of cars is still with me. So those, really, they're the three things in my life. Obviously, other than family, you know, wife, children, the rest of it, that obviously is what goes on in your life, and that's incredibly important. I'd hate not to have that. Um, I certainly wouldn't, even those three things, I wouldn't swap them for, you know, being married and having children. You know, I have to put that in because of the kids, don't I? <laughs> Sorry, only joke. I have to put that in because of the wife and kids. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being funny, being facetious. <laughs> no, but I think, you know, getting carried away and saying that I love those other things so much makes it sound as though I don't have an interest in real life, you know. <laughs> I do as long as it's got that base in the first place, basically. A good, firm base, family-wise. Uh, I've never actually enjoyed it. I have been single for times in my life, obviously, and I've actually, to be quite frank, never, never enjoyed it, ever, you know. I think that's why I've always been faithful to my wives, because in actual fact, you know, I've never thought of it in any other way, basically. <laughs>